Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production. That's the sound of the rain. We've got rain, we've got wind. Actually, it was sleet about five minutes ago. Are you sure we're in April? These, uh, the photo walks the last couple of weeks, I've kind of been ducking in and out of tree cover because there's been, you know, high winds. Today there's a, a distant rumble. I mean, is that thunder? And I'm, I'm walking in woodland, hopefully not in a thunderstorm. That wouldn't be the most sensible thing. Let me get a picture. It's quite a, it's quite a stark evening, really. I, um, the trees where I am at the moment are still fairly bare, actually. So, um... What shall I get? Let's get these uh, oh, it's wonderful shapes just appearing out of the um, out of the waters here. Let me get let me get this. Hold on. Now, when I say waters, it's a sort of dark stream, really. Very is it peat here? Very peaty kind of stream. Well, that's what it looks like. Um, but these uh, wonderful trees, sort of shapes folding in and out of each other, look fantastic. If I really place my imagination, I could be in a mangrove. <laughs> but I'm not. Here we go. Let's get the first shot of the day. Shutter speed 110, F5, ISO 160. One more. Um, life is like buses, isn't it? It seems to happen in twos. There's a word I've heard twice in seven days that refers to, to photography, or more, more aptly, actually, the person behind the camera. I heard it once talking to a photographer and once in a letter. And the letter's featured a little bit later on. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that is worth 18 points in Scrabble if you weren't doubling letter scores and so on and so forth. It hasn't, uh, hasn't got a lot of big scoring letters. Neil, what is this word? It better be a good one. Misanthrope. Misanthrope. Oh, Neil. It's not a very inspiring word, not very uplifting. I was expecting a word from you to put me on my A game for the day, and you give me that. Is that all you have to offer at the start of today's walk? We've got miserable weather, <laughs> rain, sleet, uh, possible thunder, and misanthrope. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid it's going to be that word. Um, I, I know you know what it means, but for the other listener, a misanthropic person does not like people and expects the worst of them. Opposite, really, in some ways, of a, a philanthrope. Uh, although not perfectly or exactly. Um, mis, mis, misan, <laughs> misanth I could edit this, but uh, let's be honest. Uh, misanthropy is the general hatred, dislike, distrust or contempt of the human species, human behaviour and human nature. Um, in shortened terms, a misanthrope doesn't like people has no time for them really and definitely wouldn't be playing Scrabble with anybody and he probably wouldn't choose to either. Um, it's said actually that Shakespeare, now I looked this bit up obviously, I didn't know this, it's said that, uh, that Shakespeare had this as a facet of his personality. Obviously not always. Now the photographer I met was at a wedding I was at and we, and we got chatting. I always manage to find a, a photographer to talk to in a room, it's, it seems. They're usually holding onto their, their camera in a certain way. Uh, that kind of, I know how this works, and I'm not afraid to use it way. So we, uh, so we got chatting, and he very, very quickly declared that he didn't like people very much at all. And the, the whole process of being at this wedding was actually quite painful for him. Um, he was he was an 18 pointer there's no doubt about that but but wait for it turns out and this is what I wasn't quite expecting he's a not a landscape photographer or you know a photographer that doesn't necessarily have to mix with people he's actually a portrait photographer and a very good one which uh, immediately had me raising my eyebrows in uh, in what must have been an overly obvious fashion because he said and I'm using a little license here uh, recalling our conversation no 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 no. actually he said it's quite handy not to like the people you meet very much it means I have to really work hard to find something about them I would possibly like I'm told though I unlock people and that really comes he said from not liking them at all when they walk into a room 
Now, I thought that was quite a fascinating angle from which to come as a photographer, or, or, or even in life. And uh, so we had quite a long chat for somebody who, uh, who doesn't like people, which, uh, which fascinated me even more. I thought, um, I thought perhaps I had unlocked him in some respects. A, a bit naive of me, really, because then I made the mistake of offering up my card if he should like to talk on this show about this trait, which I thought might be quite interesting for us. Um, but he said, uh, no, you're all right. Save the trees. I'd only throw it away. When you weren't looking, of course. I'm uh, misanthropic, but I'm not completely without manners. And, uh, and with that, we ended our chat and we kind of, uh, well, we kind of danced around each other for the rest of the day. And I tried to work out how or why he was <laughs> even in this place. But then um, on Wednesday evening, just the other night, I got an email from him out of the blue. He should have taken the card. It would have saved him time because um, he had to track me down through some friends. Or, or in, in his case, I, I guess, contacts. Saying, um, I actually enjoyed our conversation. I may even consider your offer of coming onto the programme. That's not a promise in any way, of course. Remember, I still don't like you. <laughs> and he signed off with a, with a smiley emoji. And if you're thinking, oh, blimey, you're, you're brave. Men mentioning this, he could be listening. He kind of gave me permission to do so, really. Uh, but um, isn't that the most amazing thing about people and what we do? For me, um, for me, that's sound uh, and pictures, but it's the real magic, isn't it? Unlocking, unlocking our common love of this thing, unlocked, I think, he's normally very steadfast position. Um, unlocking is, is the word that perhaps I... I should have used at the start of the show. Oh, that would have been far more inspirational, Neil. Yes, it probably would have been, wouldn't it? Uh, but it's only 16 points in Scrabble. Uh, but that is the magic of photography, isn't it? Not Scrabble, but, uh, but unlocking what you see before you. And my guest today, Alex Soth, has this wonderful way of doing that in his pictures. I, um, I must just add for clarification that uh, he, he was an inspiration to talk with. And um, as I edited the conversation yesterday afternoon, there was, uh, there was a moment where that sheer delight of finding the key to unlock something uh, absolutely shone through in something that he said. And we'll be talking about that together. Today on The Photo Walk. Just that one picture that I bought in that store led me on this journey. Yeah. And that's, that, for me, that's at the heart of my process. It's almost like web surfing, but in the real world. And it's like you catch a wave and you ride it. And sometimes that can be visual or sometimes it can be some idea or what have you. But it's so magical. And it's, it's why I do it. Stories of life told by photographers. Today, those stories and voices come from our guest, Alex Soth. Also, Joel Myrowitz, Paul Sanders, Sean Tucker, Valerie Jardin, Mikhail Palinchak, our patron, Ryan Katsanis, and you. It's a special and unique podcast made out on location. Me with my camera, you with yours, earbuds in, a flask of coffee, a packet of my favourite Gary Baldies, and a mailbag of letters as we walk and talk. These photo walks are inspired from and by your letters and the pictures you send in where you've been walking with your thoughts on why photography means so much to you. And keep sending them in to studio at photographydaily.show. Inspire a worldwide community of photographers, no matter what interest, genre or skill level. So what's in the mailbag? Well, I'll tell you in a moment, as always, after I show my sincere thanks to mpb.com for sponsoring this time that we spend walking together. mpb.com is the number one company in the UK, the US and Europe when it comes to buying and selling and trading used camera kit online. And they're a company that I personally use. They help photographers like me, like you, to buy, trade and sell our kit online. And sustainability being very important, you'll also be part of that circular economy by using them. 
so it's a safe place to do business with guarantees upon what you buy and product specialists who are photographers and creators who've been answering questions that you send in and today it's one from Edward Rockhopper. Are there any older models of digital camera that MPB are seeing an increase in value? You sound like you might be a collector. I ask, he says, because I was looking today at the X100 line. So, Neil, you got to me, I'll admit. And it seemed that the X100 was more expensive than the X100S. And from MPB, although the original X100 is still very popular, its current price is less than the newer X100S. Oh, it's very rare for a camera that's been replaced to be more expensive than the camera that's replaced it. However, we do tend to find that compact cameras aimed at street photography, now they hold their value quite well versus some other cameras. So send your questions to our email address, studio at photographydaily.show. Sell the kits you're not using. Trade it in for the stuff you need to create. Buy used, spend less and get more at mpb.com. Our patrons also keep these boots walking, cue the song and we'll hear from some of them later on. Today, lots of stuff to think about. I think it's a, a real thinker's episode. And I'd say you've, you've done me real proud with your letters and pictures that you've sent in. And uh, if after today's show you think, hmm, now I want to do that, I'll pepper the email address throughout the show. So today then, some thoughts or pictures following the new show on Mondays, The Assignment, uh, what the big names of conflict photography are bringing to their coverage of Ukraine, and why their input and ideas are precious. Madison Thorne sends pictures from Nashville of The Vigil. The mental health benefits of photography. I know we talk about this quite often, and unashamedly we'll talk about it more. And what happens when your plans go wrong? Well, I'll give you a clue. Your pictures get better. And the joy of observing life. That's what's on the show. Shall we walk then? Checklist out. Coffee and Garibaldi's. Definitely there, Neil. Check. Boots on and laced. Check. Walking trousers. Uh, long socks for those that walk amongst the rattlesnakes and scorpions with your shorts. Check. Spare batteries. Check. Fillmore cards. Check. Earbuds in. Check. Lens caps off. Let's walk. Oh, the clouds are moving really quickly. I'm looking across and thinking, that looks a bit dark. <laughs> And it's on its way. I thought we were due for some nice blue sky for a while. Let me get a picture. Let, let me show you what it looks like today out here. Right, I'm going to have to engage neutral density filter. I'm using the, uh, the um, X100V. Let's have a look at this. Wow. That does look really very angry. Are you going to get rained on, Neil? Yes. All probability, I'd say yes. Thank you for the, for the letters you send in, for your comments on the website, show pages, our Instagram, and uh, your picture stories in the Facebook group. I love to read your thoughts. And um, we sometimes I know are very personal stories. So, uh, as I said last week and the week before, I'm sure, and the week before that, it's a deep, genuine privilege to receive your letters. I'm on my travels again soon. This time to the beautiful Lake District. I may or may not be meeting up with our friend Niels Armelinks from episode 279, the, uh, the episode called A Life Well Lived Making Pictures. He cycles the peaks of the, uh, of the Lake District. And uh, actually, he said I could borrow one of his bikes, which, um, well, I don't know. I mean, he has proper professional bikes. I wouldn't trust myself on one of those. But, um, <laughs> and, and the, the inclines he cycles... I'm also not quite sure that he uh, that he's fully taken on board my my level of fitness for that kind of work. But um, but yes, he's kind of on his travels too. So so we may be cyclists, as he would say, or we may not be in, in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks. But uh, I'm I'm really hoping to meet up with him. We will do at some stage. Uh, can I just start today's show by thanking you for the pictures you sent in following the first assignment show Monday just gone episode 289 the challenge was to shoot like a historian to photograph in a way 
that uh, that you document today the, the the future for tomorrow and it was said by sean tucker neil you've given it away ah yes but uh, if you didn't listen to the show on monday which was only six minutes 15 seconds long uh, very bite-sized you'd have uh, you'd have missed some examples sean gave and my mis- my mysterious nostalgia for one particular roadside diner. So it's still worth going back and listening to and getting a much better idea of uh, what Sean's looking for within that, that uh, assignment. Uh, bite-sized assignment. Bite-sized, a very strange phrase, isn't it? Like bite-sized versions of our, our, our favourite. What do they used to call them? Fun-sized bar, not bite-sized. They were fun, fun-sized Mars bars, uh, which is a, a chocolate confectionery in the UK a chocolate bar in the UK, a candy bar, Mars bar. Do you get Mars in other countries? I would have thought so. They're quite popular here. But fun, I never quite got the idea of, uh, of the idea that they were fun. What was fun about a chocolate bar that was, that was shrunk? Fun-sized chocolate bars. Mum, you must talk about my sandwich box. I opened it up lunchtime today. Cheese, and, cheese sandwich is normal. Uh, what do we also get? Oh, yes, sour, sats- sour satsumas, as normal. Uh, the ones that make you look like you're chewing a wasp. And uh, I'm a favourite chocolate candy bar, only 20 times smaller than normal. Fun-sized. What's fun about that? How in the name of St. Cadbury is that supposed to be fun? It's like something from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Can you, can, can you see the candy bar? Yeah, it's, uh, it's over there, hidden under a raisin. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, yes, I, uh, I, I took part in the challenge. I'm hoping that by the time this airs, mine will be up there. I've, I've got to make sure I put yours up there first. But um, I, went for, um, I, I went for a button, a button by an elevator, for the reasons that, you know, one, one day something clever will probably replace the button, won't it? It'll, it'll read your retina. You won't have to press anything in life. You just sort of dart your eyes towards it. Um, but uh, then, yes, this. Now, I, I, want to, uh, I want to highlight this one. And please go to the episode page and see this particular picture by Gert Jan Cole in Holland Land. Uh, you can see the picture. It's on show page, uh, episode 289. Uh, but let me read you what Gert wrote so you can now form a picture in your mind as you listen. This image, says Gert, was shot during one of our weekend photo walks from a dune top near Zandervoort in the, uh, the Netherlands land. <laughs> You're adding the land nicely. It shows the Tata steel plant near Eimarden. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Eimarden, um, which is some six kilometres up north. The compression of the telelens I shot it with crams everything into one frame. Uh, emphasising how heavily polluting industry, leisure and housing are really close to each other in proximity terms. And a recent report shows that this plant is a, a massive source of nitrogen oxides, sulphur oxides and particulates. Oh, sounds nice. Why would you want to go on the beach near that? Uh, the sea breeze sends all those toxic fumes either to the densely populated cities in the east or to a vulnerable nature reserve stretching from north to south along the coastline. The report made it clear that this will soon be a thing of the past. You see, photographing like a historian. Oh, it's an amazing picture. And it really does bring all these things together. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly, all in one frame. And uh, yes, you're shooting like a historian. Amazing. So your image of that plant, cheek by jowl with nature reserves, leisure, the beach, the beach goers. Oh, that's, that's kind of like a picture postcard uh, of, um, of the past one day. It really is. Kerry Adams as well on the show page for 289. Um, Your photograph, similar kind of lines really, of the the big cooling towers with the pylons in front of them as uh, something that's gradually disappearing from our our shared horizons. When we look out across our our fields, fantastic. What a gritty, beautifully contrasty black and white. That floats my boat. Uh, immediately so uh, thank you for sending in your uh, your your first pictures for the the new assignment show it's on a monday every monday we set you something for the next seven days just to make you think about your picture making and uh, to share with you a little of how the show sounds here's some um, here's a bit of monday's 
show just gone and a teaser for the one that's coming up this coming Monday with another friend of the show, Valerie Jardin. So Sean Tucker and Valerie Jardin. Go and find, you know, the back of an old car and photograph it at a cool angle because the shapes of those cars used yeah. to be amazing and yes. now they're a bit boring. Or go and find an old diner, you know, the, the kind of diner porn stuff that you see on, on Instagram now. It's pretty prolific. <laughs> yes. Like, but what, what, what are those for us now? Like, it's a good exercise to be thinking forwards because oh. so many of us are trying to photograph for the, the likes of the attention we can get on an image today. Yeah. Try taking the long view of it and think, what if I was collecting a catalog of images now that only got released in 40 years? We never do that because we want the yeah. instant attention. Men, look at the long shadows. I mean, yeah. sometimes the shadows will take a life of their own. The shadow will become the subject. Yeah. Uh, actually, and, uh, and and there's so many great opportunities. I mean, I think when you're a documentary or street photographer, I don't really like street photographer because I spend more time photographing people on the coast, <laughs> actually on the street <laughs> these days. But um, there are stories everywhere. You yeah. just have to learn to to see, not just look. Sean Tucker and uh, Valerie Jardin. You might be thinking that you've worked out the assignment for Monday from Valerie's words there, but no, 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 no. It's not about looking for a shadow, uh, for instance. Uh, appropriate, though, to play them both because they've, um, they've both featured within this letter from George Lapin. Hello, Neil. Quick mail to say thank you for the shows. The photo walk is a, a Monday listen in my world, usually on my way to work, but you'll be pleased to hear that... Um, one of your checklist items is appropriate for me, and that's the one where you say earbuds in. I'm curious, what earbuds do you use when you make your photo walks without a microphone in hand? Also, it was great to hear Sean Tucker set the first weekly assignment. The podcast has introduced me to many new names, but I also like the fact that you seem to be building a community of friends who feel like co-conspirators in your quest to get the world walking on a Friday with a camera. Well, it almost sounds like a sort of a, a, a political thing, doesn't it? The, uh, the Friday photo walk party. I'll vote for you, Neil. Can I have some more, please, sir? Says, uh, says George. I know you have a passion for Dickens. I do. But not really for gruel. Gruel. Is it gruel? How do you spell gruel? Gruel? Gruel. Gruel. That porridgey thing that they served with uh what what is gruel it's it's um it's porridge isn't it it's oats and salt and water oh horrible my granddad sorry granddad i'm looking up towards the skies as i mention your name but my granddad granddad harry he uh, when i went to stay um <laughs> he would uh, he would serve me porridge and just smother it in salt it's good for you lad Make hairs grow on your chest. Sadly, it didn't, it didn't keep hairs growing on my head, Grandad. But I do, have, <laughs> I do have some on my chest. Maybe it did work. But since you ask about my earbuds, um, yeah, I, I do, uh, when I'm photographing, if I'm not making a photo walk, I, I, yeah, I do. I do like to wear earbuds as I'm walking, but not as often as you'd think. Um, because equally, I, I take my microphone with me a lot wherever I go. And uh, I'm always listening for the, for the nature sounds because I, I, well, I just like to hear it, if I can record it. I'm a collector of sound in that respect. But yeah, I, I, my, um, my earbuds, well, the ones I had, they were, they were Beats ones, which were, uh, well, the Beats ones I, I had, and I'm speaking in the past tense there, they snapped a couple of weeks back. They just, the ear bit just went, ping, came off. And so... Uh, I went out and bought a cheap set. Now, the kids actually have, have the fancy ones to go with their, their phones. Um, Dad, meanwhile, gets the cheapest ones he can possibly find online. Buy, buy cheap, buy twice is uh, a mantra I always use, but don't follow myself. So, uh, no, the ones I have at the moment, I'm not sure I should actually mention the trade, the trade name of them, but um, mm, not very good. I'd probably be better off sticking a tin candle each year. Uh, they have all the acoustic presence of two cans of empty Heinz beans. Uh, anyway, I saw a comment in the show notes in episode 288. Thank you for leaving the comments on the, uh, the show pages. Um, 
it, uh, it's great to get your feedback. And it's, I think it's fantastic for those that take part in the show also, because I know they look at those notes uh, to see what you thought. And, uh, and uh, so I'm going to start with one from Mark Kranjnank. Uh, on episode 288 photo walk punk rock star to photographer that was the title i came for sean tucker says mark stayed for the wonderful new podcast that i've found you're very very kind mark thank you i'll shift uncomfortably with the flattery clearly uh, listen to this episode while uh, while on a very rainy wednesday morning walk and uh, and loved it it featured of course john mayer who uh, was a was a buzzcocks drummer the punk band buzzcocks who now makes these fantastic photographs out in the wilds of um, of uh, the island of harris uh, where he lives and um, yeah he makes these pictures of abandoned houses which are are just incredible uh, looking forward to diving deep into uh, other past episodes, says Mark, and I'll be on the lookout for new ones. I've done a fair amount of abandoned photography as well, but with a little twist, I supplement the photo with some flash fiction about the setting. Perhaps I'll send some in. Now, Mark, you absolutely have to, after you said that, because I, I'm intrigued by the flash fiction Send them, please, to studio at photographydaily.show. There's the email address to send your pictures and stories and thoughts and comments to studio at photographydaily.show. There's a horse coming towards me. Oh, not sure what I feel about a horse coming towards me. (laughs) It's a wild horse. I hope you're not too wild. Be kind. Ah, I feel a bit... I'm always a bit nervous about horses. I'm okay around cattle, but horses, I'm never that confident about. I'll walk the other direction. (laughs) Although now he's following me. (laughs) Stay where you are. Stop following. Stop it. No, he's, he's following me all the way along. Go away. They don't have anything. Oh, no, there's two of them. No, hang on. Three. Stop it. I wish my friend Anna was here. She'd, uh, she grew up with horses. She'd know what to do. Actually, my reprobate mate Mullins would know what to do as well, wouldn't he? Now that he has a horse. Stop following. Let me find a, let me find a path. I sort of, I can't really concentrate on my emails with them following me. What do you think I've got? I've got no food. All right, more letters. Here's, um, while I walk in the other direction, Here's one from Matthias Fox. Hello, Neil. Hope you're well. In episode 284 of uh, Photography Daily, you interviewed some photojournalists in Ukraine. I figured this short article in a French online magazine uh, might interest you. It's, uh, it is, by the way, translated into English. Best regards, Matt. Uh, and thank you for sending that in, Matt. It was indeed very interesting. I'm going to be sharing the link on the show page today since it's, uh, it's quite a long piece to, to read out. And there'd be a lot, of, a lot of spelling going on if I started to read out the URL. Um, in essence, it's a, it's a piece about um, the so-called veteran photographers who've travelled to Ukraine to cover this, well, this pivotal story so early in this new millennia. Uh, Let me read a short excerpt from it so you get an idea. It's about the photographers that have gone to Ukraine. They came, they're almost all there. Nakwe, the two Turnleys, Bouvet, Delahaye, Chevelle, Haviv, Van der Stock, Jagub Zadeh. With absolute due respect, and very due respect, not one of those Facebook comments where somebody says, with due respect when they have precious little of it in reality. But with due respect to Alfred Yagabzade, perhaps, um, perhaps this is a name that's not so familiar to you. Hang on, I'm just going to get through this. Look, I managed to find a, a gate. Ponies on Snell's more common. Please, please do not feed the ponies or try to pet them. This can lead to developing bad behaviour. Uh, they're very hardy traditional breeds that survive while well grazing on the common. Thank you. Yes. Well... There's now a bit more space between me and thee. Um, yes, so um, Jagub Zadeh, yes. Um, his name might not be so familiar to some people, but it really should be. 
Uh, his work in conflict zones and his sheer belief in showing what the real story is. That even brought him into, uh, well, his own conflict in his own country of uh, Iran, where he told the story of the presidential campaign that led to, to large-scale protests in 2009 when the, the results looked uh, well, probably the, uh, the kindest way to, to say this is highly flawed. Um, so he was, um, they didn't like the pictures that he took, so they banned him from taking pictures in the country and he moved to France. It's a, it's a fascinating story, and one I'd, uh, I'd love to cover more, but, um, well, he knows of the brutality and ferocity of a war with Russia uh, because he was wounded by a tank shell in the Chechen War. Um, but anyway, the piece I've, I've linked to starts with Patrick Chevelle's story. And I'll read a couple of words, but I'd like you to read the, the entire article because I'm sure you'll be absolutely fascinated. As the piece reads, he made up his mind while tending to his roses in his backyard in Paris. When French photographer Patrick Chevelle, 72, learned that Russian troops were gathering on the border of Ukraine, he declared, I'm not going to be gardening while all this is happening. Chevelle had a, an assignment from Paris Match for a, a feature story in St. Petersburg. He called his editors to say he was heading for Ukraine instead. And he told a, a young writer to go and fetch his flat jacket from his home. Youth is uh, not always an advantage, uh, as, it, as it's pointed out in this piece. A few of the elders expressed concern about the lack of experience of some younger reporters. Chevelle said he had to tell a younger colleague not to wear a helmet in the car near checkpoints as you could be confused for a soldier. See, these are, these are small, but I would say vital, vital knickknacks of experience that led the writer to, to quip photojournalists who are old enough to collect social security. I, I tell you what, I, I'd say they got old enough to collect it precisely because of the... Um, I suppose it's an unconscious competence, isn't it? Making pictures under fire. But uh, do read the rest. I've, I'll put the link on the show page today. Loads of things on the show page to go and see today. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating read uh, about the, um, these established photographers that have gone to Ukraine. And then um, a letter from our friend and former guest as well, Madison Thorne. Hey, Neil. I thought you might have an interest in some of these images that I took downtown Nashville land at the candlelit vigil for peace in Ukraine, uh, organised by, um, by members of the community and Amnesty International. The event was well covered by my fellow photographers, says Madison, so I gave myself a slightly different task of trying to find the smallest moments of the evening while still telling the story. My thought being that I, I do believe the smallest acts collectively can bring about change. While I photographed one sunflower clutched in the hands of one person, there are countless sunflowers being held across the world in support. These tiny moments paint the larger picture. Oh, you're so right, Madison, you really are. And I promise you, uh, the sunset that evening, uh, says Madison, the picture of which you can see on the show page today. Uh, the way you see it in the picture, this sunset, uh, an almost um, well, perfect reflection of the Ukrainian flag. While I did do some dodging and burning to get the final image, the clear split between the blue and the yellow, stroke orange, it's more yellow, I think, uh, was there without my doing. And it, yeah, it's an extraordinary picture. It really is haunting in some respects down to what you've just said um enjoying the episodes as always madison and thank you thank you madison for for your mail let me play a few thoughts on my conversation with uh, mikhail palinchak from episode 284 which was voices from ukraine um here he is talking about a well, i suppose a, a not so typical typical day which inevitably if you look at his instagram now typically changes quickly. For example, right now, I'm in an apartment of my colleague. This is the first time in three days that we decided to leave our office with a shelter and went to apartment, finally to get normal sleep and to have a shower, to change our clothes. So at this point, this is good uh, evening. And I hope uh, that nothing uh, happened this night. It's very strict now in Kyiv to walk. Kyiv administration and overall government in Ukraine ask uh, civilians not to walk streets even at a day. 
so I am trying to move by car and uh, right now I am waiting accreditation from Ministry of Defense so uh, additional paper shows that I am Ukrainian and I am allowed uh, to shoot so this is uh, very strict now and I, today I was uh, just uh, in a car went to the uh, local uh, supermarket to buy some reserve of food and uh, important things so I made a few photos the, and a uh, few landscape of Kiev. Uh, I see that uh, they put blocks uh, on the on the roads, so any car cannot uh, move very fast through the roads. Mikhail Palinchak, and uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping uh, he might have time to talk to us again on what he has been photographing of late in Ukraine and how he's making his well vital pictures of the uh, brutality being uncovered. Um, his Instagram at the moment is, I mean, it, it's a stark reminder of the, the utter shame of this war and uh, how um, so-called professional soldiers are acting. It's not easy viewing. But, um, but like in the, the case of my, my good friend Giles, um, his photographic work from his time covering the Balkans conflict, um, the, these, these are the images that uh, will, I suspect, be with the many others being collated as, um, as evidence. Though uh, oh, I'm just at a loss to understand how, how the world will even consider going about bringing or being able to bring anybody to justice on, on, on this. But uh, uh, Mikhail Palinchak, and as I say, I'd love to talk some more to him in the, uh, the coming weeks. There's going to be gates everywhere here. Hold on. Before we read some more of your letters, thank you for sending them in to the, uh, the photo walk edition of Photography Daily. It's easy to do. Uh, send your stories, your thoughts, your pictures. 2,000 pixels, please, on the, uh, the long side uh, to studio at photographydaily.show. Studio at photographydaily.show. The temperature is falling while I'm making this walk. Oh, <laughs> roll on May and June. Oh, um, a point was uh, was made. Sorry, on the on the. I just want to mention this as well because I put a note down here. A point was made from Mark Neville, the artist and photographer living in Ukraine, um, that perhaps uh, what wasn't needed was photojournalists from around the world jetting in, so to speak, to the area. And the local eyes on the ground know know the politics, the feeling, and the story in a way that outsiders wouldn't um, or couldn't, uh, which on on face values absolutely correct in terms of the knowledge and certainly the emotional feeling of seeing your country ravaged in this way and um, of course respecting the fact as Mark pointed out that the country has some very skilled photojournalists of, of its own but uh, I, I had this, this thought that with the suggestion these situations such as I, I don't know bodies in the street were being staged somehow by locals oh that, that a good presence of photojournalists from around the world, and this is this is where, this is where an Iranian photojournalist with roots, not perhaps in America or the UK, or any of the other so-called unfriendly countries. This this is where a truly independent eye with experience um, has has most definite importance and and, and another layer of credibility. So um, so eyes still very much on this story. Of course. Right. This week's guest. Now, Alex Soth. Uh, Magnum's Alex Soth. Rhymes with both, as he writes on his website. He is an American photographer based in Minneapolis. And I found this quote in Wiki. And I, I wish I'd perhaps mentioned this in our conversation. Oh, I so wish I had. New York Times art critic Hilary M. Sheets wrote that he's made a photographic career out of finding chemistry with, with strangers. We kind of, yeah, we do kind of cover it, but uh, that's such a poetic way of saying it. Uh, and uh, photographs, we did talk about this, loners and dreamers. Within, within our chat, we talk about his new project, A Pound of Pictures, which is um, an inspired idea. Some say he's most personal work to date um, it's all about what it means to be a photographer to to collect images to see them to make them and who you meet along the way he's been a, a full member of magnum since 2008 and and 
He is the photographer with the camera that made that exquisite work, Sleeping by the Mississippi. Two parts to today's story, as always, including some questions set by our patrons in the second half. This is uh, Alex Soth. Alec, there is a, an antiques emporium in the town next to mine, split into lots and lots of small units, each a speciality, toys and records and cameras and old tins and that. I think you can probably picture this sort of thing now. And on the right-hand side, about two-thirds of the way down, there's an old postcards and photo shop. It's not very large. It's only about five feet wide, and I think you sort of two feet, and you're within, you're within the, the actual shop itself. But it's absolutely packed from mm. floor to ceiling with old photos and stuff oh, like that. It's one of my favourite favorite places to visit because you get a glimpse into how somebody else saw the world as a photographer. And that really is how this story with your new book starts, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, well, in fact, it started earlier than that. I, I was working on a, an altogether different project that had to do with Abraham Lincoln, of all things. Right. And, uh, and then I reached a dead end. And yet I had scheduled another trip. And so I decided to go on this trip and just sort of leave myself open for whatever. And I, I stumbled into a shop very much like that. Which I've, you know, I've always enjoyed such places, but I've never known what to make of that material creatively. And I decided to to sort of let it be a guide for me and and start me moving off in a different direction and and eventually make a photo book that was kind of about photography and about yeah. the making of a photo book. <laughs> But but that that picture of the bed with the photos laid out on it, I assume I, they're, they're the pictures that you bought from the flea market and so on and so forth. Or? That was a different. That was actually a different one. Yeah, I because I so wherever I would go, I would look for photos and from flea markets and the like. But I actually I found another way to to source photographs, which is you know we all know you can buy pictures on eBay. But yeah. what what I did is, instead is I contacted people that were selling a lot of pictures on eBay. And asked if I could come visit them. And there was one particular woman in Los Angeles who's who sells photographs by the pound. Yeah. And <laughs> and so and and I asked if I could visit her. And she has these photos in a store, one of those storage facilities. And I yeah, I bought I think sixty pounds of pictures from her. Sixty pounds of pictures. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I assume yeah. I, I assume she didn't permit you to go and sort of sift through them and choose that, the, the poundage, or did she? She did. Ah. Uh, it was fat. It was speed sifting. Okay. So yes. <laughs> and my 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 teenage daughter happened to be with me on that trip. And in fact, one of the things that we I instructed my daughter. I said any picture of a young woman. Like I, w- I want to analyze what it you know what vernacular pictures of young women like like my daughter yeah. look yeah. like. So that gave her one thing to look for. You know, I'm a, I have my own sense of what I want. Yeah. Um, I look for for other things. And there are vernacular yeah. pictures in in the book as well, aren't uh, uh, the various places. Yeah, I struggled with this, uh, uh, like what to do with these things. I mean, I use them mainly as a guide for my travels, yeah. and then. But I had so many pictures and so many good pictures that I didn't quite know what to do with them. I did in the published book, each book comes with reproductions of five photographs that are loosely inserted in the book. Yeah. The special edition comes, there's 300 copies, comes with five real photographs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's 1,500 photographs that I had to arrange for those books. But yeah, I had pictures coming out of my ears. Yeah, I was going to say, you must have pounds and pounds still left over. This, this print, oh my God. This print so, run could last a while, couldn't it, with all those? <laughs> with all, yeah. With all no, those. It, no, it's and it's really, you know, we all know this, but it's just fascinating yeah. because you know, we all talk about digital photography and how there are too many pictures in the world. And, and there was there have always been too many pictures in the world. But one shouldn't think of it that way. And I, I had this epiphany at some point of an analogy that photographs are like flowers and no one complains that there are too many flowers in the world. So like with that, that spirit, yeah. I'm just, I treat these like flowers and yeah. they're, you know, and the, they can pass away and that's okay. That's wonderful. And, and on the, I don't know about you, but uh, I spent a lot, a lot of my time in that, 
particular shop that I went to, looking on the back for the note, the notation. Mm, you don't yeah. find it on all photographs. Many you don't really. Right. But, yeah. But it's uh, there's a kind of a melancholy attached when people throw out their old photographs because you don't quite know why they're getting rid of them. Is it house clearance? Is somebody passed on? Absolutely. Uh, it's it's funny. So right now, my my entire family, my wife and two children, have COVID. Uh, and so I'm staying at my parents' apartment. Right. They're out of town. And they have one of these digital frames, you know, that's rotating pictures. Yeah. And that thing is so melancholy to me. I like looking at it. It's just, you know, watching everyone age and, <laughs> you know, it's... it's <laughs> and and for me, photography really is just wrapped up in... I mean, it's wrapped up in death and aging and melancholy but also nostalgia I mean, because i know i know you're yep. a very nostalgic person <laughs> yes i mean uh i i have mixed feelings about nostalgia you know it's uh and it's, it's such a dangerous feeling i think in terms of the arts but i do yes and yeah. i'm attracted to it and kind of appalled by it which is sort of my feeling about photography too i i love it and i hate it I, I do love the way you describe the way you work when you're making photographs of paying attention to your own attention i watched the film where you were talking about mm. this book and you, you um you refer to it as a, as a buddhist approach which um i mean i think that's why the act of just making a photograph whether it's on your big camera as you've sometimes called it or mm. or a small pocketable one that that's something that can truly embrace our quiet isn't it it is. I mean, first of all, I would say it's, you know, Buddhist adjacent or inspired or something. Yeah. I don't want to claim any labels. I'm certainly no uh, Buddhist yeah. uh, scholar or anything like that. But in terms of training one's attention, yes, the act of photographing can be really useful just as sifting through photographs in that store. You know, um, one of the things that happens when you look at a lot of photographs is you start realizing that you're attracted to certain ones over others yeah. and why is that you know why do i like that picture is it because that that woman reminds me of my mother or is you know what is it and the more you practice that the more you develop a sensibility and it's just a fascinating thing to watch. Uh, and I, I, kind of a chicken and egg uh, question, but I, I know that you've you've worked on projects that one photograph or, uh, or scenario has led to the next and the next and the next. Yeah. But uh, did you find that with this as well? Once once you had some of those the sixty pounds of pictures, that some of those those uh, pictures were actually really forming your plans for the for the ones that you made for the book. Yeah, uh, quite literally. That that very first shop that I stopped into. Um, I bought this photograph. It was of a man's head from five different angles. Right. And I was really fascinated by it. And I was traveling with this uh, young assistant and I asked if I could photograph her head from five angles. Yeah. And, sh and she said, no. So then I decided, okay, I'm going to go to a professional portrait studio and have someone photograph my head. I went to this guy's place. Unbelievable. He's an older man. Um, and when he was younger, it turns out, he was the Illinois state police photographer. So, and in his basement, he had files and files of police photographs, you know, often quite yeah. bloody. Yeah. And he let me sift through these pictures, not to keep them, but to just look at them. Whoa. And I ended up there and none of this material got used, but just that one picture that I bought in that store led me on this journey. Yeah. And that's that for me, that's, at the heart of my process, it's almost like web surfing, but in the real world. And it's like you catch a wave and you ride it. And sometimes that can be visual or sometimes it can be some idea or what have you, but it's so magical. And it's it's why I do it. I, the photograph is, is, is something else, yeah. <laughs> but the experience is it just unbelievable. I'm very lucky to be able to do it. Was there a qualification process for, for a picture to be used within the book it sounds like there wasn't really that the, 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 entirely that often sometimes these would come from ideas you weren't expecting yeah the process for me was one of letting go I, you know because i started i start with all these ideas it's it's almost like in order to surf you need to st stop thinking yeah yeah <laughs> You know, so I had that idea of that head or whatever. And like, I'm trying to make that picture, but that's not the picture that I made. It was some pictures of, you know, some flowers that I drove by on the way to that 
former police photographer's house, you know, that made it into the book. And then I have to allow myself to include something in the book or exclude something else and judge it on different for different reasons. So it's a, it's a crazy process. <laughs> like it's very hard to explain to uh, non photographers for sure. Uh, to 2019, you started to um, to to photograph the project. I think 2021 was when you yep. finished. Uh, I, I I know speaking to one of your Magnum colleagues, actually Mark Power, with his latest work from America, that. That world events um, entirely redesigned his approach to his book uh, that he's oh, working man. on. Did uh, did the same happen with you? Oh, absolutely. And it's yeah. In the in the first iteration of the project, it was going to be a diary, and I was going to tell some of these stories as I as I traveled. And then the pandemic hit, and you know I live in Minneapolis, so we had George Floyd. Like, yeah. just everything changed. Yeah. And once I was able to start traveling again because this work necessitated travel i felt like once i was able to start traveling the world was so different that i had to kind of begin again yeah. um i had to let go of that diary concept and i had to really teach myself how to photograph yeah. it, particularly people again i was terrified i mean both from being you know cooped up in the house for so long as well as just all of the sort of you know racial political implications of yeah. taking someone else's picture so it was it's pretty agonizing but you, yeah. are, you actually quite enjoy being at home don't you you're, you're somebody that that uh, oh my god yeah i mean I, I have heard you say that if you could just print at home and stay at home you'd be quite happy but your work necessitates you being on the road it's 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 so bizarre. I mean, I uh, I think you know I would love to be like a sculptor. I, this room that I'm in, yeah. I mean, it's like a it's like a little cave, and uh, I'm very happy that. in here, yeah, daydreaming yeah, about yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, no, going out in the world and talking to people, it's a, it's exhausting. And I've I've tried many times to make work in a studio setting, and it just doesn't. There's no energy to it. But that's the irony, isn't it? Because I, I know it's a question that you you say you get asked most probably is this mm. sort of relaxed stance, this very very inviting way you have of being able to talk to complete strangers and uh, and photograph them where within minutes they they trust you and. I saw it actually on that film as well. It's it's something that you're very very well known for, isn't it? I guess. <laughs> it, 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 honestly, though, I am the person on the airplane. I don't talk to the person in the seat next to me. <laughs> I make no one comfortable in real life. I don't think it's. Uh, I think when I go into that space, there's something about. I, I guess it works. I don't know. It's yeah. really it's mysterious to me. Yeah, yeah. From here to there, it's a project that happened. Um, well. I happened across by accident watching a film where somebody was was talking about your work initially mm -hmm. a while back. But what a beautiful idea, though! You, I mean, oh, you, you. you described it so much better than I. But it, in essence, each picture takes you to the next. It's a sort of fluid approach, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a fluid approach, and it's uh, and like I said, it's it, it requires a kind of letting go. Yeah. And the way I always think of it for myself is holding on to handlebars, you know, really tightly, and then just sort of relaxing it. Yeah. And I don't surf, but I can imagine that feeling of like getting your balance and then having to relax in it. And, and this is the thing, incidentally, after the pandemic loosened up, is that it, there was so much tightness, you know, and I was like thinking so hard and so worried and that I wasn't able to let myself go. And so I had to teach myself to do that again. Do you feel you're there now? I was, you know, I'm now I'm a little bit out of practice again because, <laughs> but yes, I mean, I was able to photograph again and, uh, and to just relax, you know, to, I mean, I take myself way, way, way too seriously. And I think a lot of us do, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, you can see this on social media as though like our little opinion is going to change, you know, global events. Do you think that's a photographer thing? More and more, it's a it's a people thing, <laughs> you know, it's just like, every, you know, I mean, we're all our own little media channels now. Yeah. And so we're all running you know, PR for our media channels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about from here to there, that, that was what led to Sleeping by the Mississippi, wasn't it? It, re it, it was. And, yeah. and really, Sleeping by the Mississippi is from here to there. Yeah. It's just on top of, you know, I just overlaid it on the Mississippi River. But the subject of the work isn't the Mississippi River. It's, it's really wandering in that, in that process. 
Um, and this, this most recent work was kind of the inverse of that, where I started with this idea of Abraham Lincoln and his funeral train. And then I dismantled that to just have this wandering process. Yeah. So it's kind of getting back to something, a, a beginner state. And that's kind of an, the ambition over and over again is to remember that first feeling of going out photographing and being alive to the world in that way. Alex Soth returns shortly on the show. Oh, in the space of the last few minutes, the wind has died down. The hail passed over. Uh, I wouldn't say it's warm now, but uh, I've got some beautiful low evening sunshine just trying to pierce its way through uh, the trees here. And I'm getting a slight serenade uh, from, the, uh, from the bird life here. The last knockings of the light of a day. Let me, um, let me see if I can get a picture for you. Ah, oh, don't go anywhere, sunshine. I've just said that you were giving us a little bit of late evening sunshine. 7.50 shutter speed, F5, 160 ISO. I think this is going to be more silhouette now. Oh, the sunshine's just disappeared behind that cloud. Patience, Neil, patience. It'll come back up. I've got a feeling that my... Uh, uh, that, that my um, my pictures today, my sketchbook images, I don't know. They're going to be... Um, well, I don't want to use the word drab, but the light is not very inspiring this evening. Uh, time to... Um, time to... Stand by. <laughs> time to big up the patrons of the show. Neil, did I hear you say big up? I can see my kids literally folding themselves into cracks in the pavement with me saying that. Oh, Dad, you're so embarrassing. Can't say big up. Like you have elasticated jeans and you wear T-shirts beneath the belt. I, uh, I did ask our Jack uh, what, what I should say the other day. Instead of saying big up, I said, what, what should I say instead of big up? And he said, probably nothing. But, but one thing for certain, he said, big up and shout out should not be said by somebody my age who remembers when cars had only three gears in manual. Actually, he didn't exactly say that. That's me editorialising slightly. But the look of horror on his face that I should ever, 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 ever say big up. And on, and on that note, I'm digressing a bit now, but um, one of the most, I think one of the most awkward things to come out of COVID for me, socially that is, the, the, the social awkwardness, uh, was this fist bump. Oh, I mean, cool, trendy uh, sports, music and movie stars, they can fist bump, it looks all right. When I do it, oh, it's like believing you're still cool enough to say dude or man to people. Anybody over 45, stop saying dude. Don't do it. Um, you can't get away with it. There are some exceptions. Keith Richards, he could say dude, and he could probably fist bump as well. Oh, Patti Smith, yeah, the poet of punk. She could. Hendrix, Hendrix. Oh, he could, he could have said it forever, couldn't he? Anyway, sorry, digressing. Photography Daily has an incredible community of supporters called patrons who are the engine of support behind this whole thing. And you really are. You are the reason I have these, these wild ideas that we can make this community of photographers who care about their picture making and, and care about other people as well. Because I, for me, that's a, that's a big part. It's an important part of this. Each month, you can help support this show for the price of a cup of coffee or a roll of HP5 or you can help towards the cost of licensing the music for the, for the programme. If you go to the website, photographydaily.show and press the orange, the orange button, top right hand corner, you can find out how to join. Membership starts at just a, a few bucks or pounds or uh, goats per square inch per month and it makes all the difference. And each month to thank our fantastic community. We meet on Zoom and we share our pictures and our stories and our thoughts. And you can see those on the picture post tab on the website. And, uh, and we have a more episode of the weekend. Now this weekend, tomorrow, is it weekend already? Yes, it is. Um, I've been photographing at the asylum. And I'm being cautious how I say this. It's a place I've been wanting to make pictures in for a while and you'll find out more about it tomorrow also on a serious note 
um, and, and quite a lengthy piece about Patreon's decision to let Russian creatives still be a part of of the platform. It's a, uh, I, I imagine this is a this is a changeable changeable feast, moving feast. I don't know, but uh, yeah. Um, but I've, I've put quite a complex piece together. I have much to say about it. Plus some extra words from an interview with the British Egyptian photographer. Laura L. Tentarway, next week's guest. She is a Canon ambassador. She tells the most extraordinary stories with her pictures, uh, but equally with soundscapes that they do. They stop me in my tracks. And I've got a few extra words following the interview that I'd like to share with you on the more episode tomorrow. Um, it's a kind of, well, I don't think it's intensely private, but. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a few thoughts I have to go along with it on the more episode tomorrow. But uh, in the meantime, let me play some inspiration from one of our patrons. This is, um, this is Ryan Katsanis. And we've got, a, we've got a mental health episode coming up shortly. I've uh, dropped a line. And sorry if, if, um, if you were one of those people that received that line. I know it's been a couple of weeks since uh, we last spoke. But um, I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you in a forthcoming episode, which I think is a very, a very, very important episode about mental health and photography. But here's Ryan talking about what photography brings mentally to him, one of our, our wonderful patrons. Yeah, so it's sort of like my um, my way of unwinding, you know. Uh, so like so many people, I know you've heard this before. I, I started street photography during the divorce process, barely before that. But during the divorce process, um, I had a four-year-old and a uh, six-year-old, and they were gone 85% of my time. And it was awful, obviously, it's always awful. And so I started wandering the streets with my camera. I found that being out there in my head, not with anybody, just wandering around, I could take a few pictures here and there and really just kind of escape and have something that not only filled my time, but had me kind of focusing on something other than life, you know, my life anyway. And so that's what really solidified street photography for me was was that whole, that I hate to use the word therapeutic, but that is the best word for it, you know, just kind of got me through some tough times. But even today, um, I, I wouldn't say I'm going through tough times, but there are no bad days out. I'm sure you probably have the same sim similar experience. Even if you don't necessarily take a shot or even a good shot, just the fact that you were out there, you were seeing, you were breathing fresh air, you're walking, you're observing. Okay, maybe you didn't take a picture or a good picture that day, but you still had a good day out. Um, so I love that about that aspect of photography is uh, just being out there in the element. And even if you don't have your camera with you, you could be seeing photographically. You could say, oh, I wish I had my camera or even when you're driving by, you know, you can always be kind of honing that skill with or without a camera. Ryan Katsanis. Thank you, Ryan, for, for sharing your thoughts with us on the, on the podcast today. It's the Friday Photo Walk, where we take uh, our cameras out together and we, uh, we just walk and talk about our picture making, what it means to us, where we've been, what we're doing, uh, what we've seen. And uh, if you'd like to send in your thoughts and your pictures, I'd love to hear from you. Send them to studio at photographydaily.show. That's studio at photographydaily.show. Uh, oh, yes, pictures, 2,000 pixels on the wide side, or the long side, as we say. Here's, um, here's a letter from a good friend of the show. It's Jason, Jason Fang in New Zealand land. Now, it does sound strange putting land on the end of a land, doesn't it? Uh, I forget, Jason, that as we're heading towards summer, he says, looking into the air, thinking, right, <laughs> where is that impending summer? Uh, things on the, uh, the other side of this, this flat earth are heading into colder climes now. I watched a very disturbing, the reason I say that is I watched a very disturbing account the other day on telly of a, of a man who, who believes this is the case. I know there's a lot of flat earthers, but he made a proper pig's ear of describing how you travel from one side of a flat earth to the other. Um, which has nothing to do with your letter, but I just thought I'd, I'd mention that. Um, hi, Neil. As the days get shorter and the temperature starts to cool, 
I decided to take an autumn break with a short trip south to New Zealand's capital, Wellington. I've always wanted to go to New Zealand. Oh, one day, I said wanted, I shouldn't speak in the past, or the never-never. Um, I should speak in the yes, one day I will come to Wellington. Um, the, the past few months have been tough for me, says Jason, without uh, disrespecting other people who are in much tougher situations. I wanted to acknowledge my my own backpack of first world problems and use this trip to reset and recharge. So here I am, for the first time ever, I've muted work alerts on my phone and intentionally avoided any formal planning for my trip. The only rules of this trip uh, is that I want to spend time meditating and specifically increase the time I meditate for. Well, it sounds very good to me so far. Other than that, I'll let things flow. I wasn't going to make the trip about photography, but as I write this email after my trip, who was I kidding? Uh, my X-Pro3 camera never left my side. All excited, I arrived at the airport early on the Wednesday. The speaker by the gate crackled into life 30 minutes before departure and announced that the flight was delayed. Oh, that was disappointing, but not unusual, given Wellington does experience some bad weather. I don't like it when they... Uh, when they say tech, do you, Jason, as an excuse? Because often they don't really tell you. I mean, when I've had flights delayed, they don't even really talk about the weather. They just say, we've got, we've got a problem. And you think, a problem? A problem? A tech problem? And usually it's something like the aircraft cabin loo not working or something, isn't it? It's, it's, not, it's not like the rivets have all fallen out of something very, very important to staying in the air. It's normally something like that. And I think they should just tell you, look, the loo doesn't work. I'll oh, take my chances. Come on, let's go. Um, the speaker spat out a cancellation announcement. Fog at Wellington Airport meant that Air New Zealand couldn't land their planes in the capital. Three flight changes and another return trip home. And back to the airport saw me sleeping back at home on Wednesday. The zen of meditation would, <laughs> would have to wait. Two more flight changes later, I'm booked on a 3pm flight to Wellington on the Thursday and I've extended my stay in Wellington another day. Even though my flight was delayed by a day, this delay allowed multiple good things to happen. My supportive husband and I got to prune back a dangerous broken branch hanging dangerously after a big storm and I got to spend some more time with our 12-year-old dog Bobby. If you take a breath and pause, loads of good stuff happens. Isn't that true in life? In an ironic twist of fate, I walked past the Villa Maria Vineyard on Thursday morning. As I was whiling away some time before the flight, the vineyard was covered in fog and the quietness of dawn evoked a, a real sense of calm. Fog which had prevented my trip to find Zen yesterday had now created a beautiful scene to photograph in front of me. Just as we don't have to travel afar to find good shots, there's no time like now to find calm and zen. Now, you can see that picture on the show page, and it is fantastic. And you wouldn't have got that had you... Uh, well, you might have got different shots, of course, in Wellington, going a day early, but you wouldn't have got that shot, would you? On to Wellington, I decided to do a Photography Daily dash mod. What is that, you might ask? It's a photo walk paired with Craig Mod's approach of walking to discover the sense and feel of a place. Now, I have written to this, this Mr. Mod, and uh, so far, nothing back. Um, so uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and I might send another couple of mails. I've only ever spent time in the, the city. I don't know much about the wider area, and so I thought I'd combine both creative approaches and walk the eight kilometers into town. Wellington is a hub of creativity and liberalism, and I hope you get a chance to visit. There's even a shop selling food stuff from uh, the UK. He says in brackets, I realized belatedly that I missed my chance to find the famous Garibaldi biscuits. Do you think they had them? Oh, surely. Regarding my trip down, I feel I, I achieved a lot by not doing a lot. Maybe this runs counter to conventional wisdom, if there's such a thing, but I champion slowing down in order to move ahead. The lead up to this trip also reminded me that I don't need a magical click of the seatbelt on a plane seat to signal the start of relaxation. I can, we can all find our own moments to pause and find our center. 
I spent an additional $300 to discover that, but I sincerely hope others manage to get that in a cheaper or costless fashion. On the show page then today, you're going to find two links. One is to Jason's uh, Instagram, but then another that invites you to a wonderful pictorial blog about his trip to, to Wellington, and you must go and see it. Uh, and I've, I'm going to include some pictures on the show page today. Jason, a wonderful story, all about mindfulness, really. So let me play a little bit of inspiration from Paul Sanders, the, uh, the captain of mindfulness in my book. He's, uh, here's a little of one of our conversations, and I'll, I'll link to it, uh, when we talked about smelling and feeling the pictures as you make them, being aware as you make the pictures. Uh, for, uh, forgetting F-stops and stopping to make notes on how you're feeling as you make the picture. Maybe F, here's a thought, maybe F should stand for feeling. No, Neil, just play the tape. Oh, OK then. I probably watch what people would call the best light come and go because at times it just doesn't speak to me. And I like to listen to the birds, I like to listen to the water... Um, I like to listen to the wind in the leaves. I like to smell the damp grass or the rotting leaves or whatever else is is going on. You know, if I'm at the sea, you can taste the the salt in the air. Yes. Um, I like to get all of that inside me, and I often just write little, you know, words or sentences or whatever um, about what I feel, what I'm seeing, what I'm sensing, because it's all really important, and it all adds into the photograph. Um, because photography, you know, although it's a two-dimensional end product, if you print your pictures, it's very much an experiential thing. And if you meditate, if you if you take meditation in the old-fashioned sense, where you sort of sit somewhere quietly, you don't let your mind go blank. You know, you are fully aware of everything around you. Me- meditation is not about being asleep; it's about being awake and really, really awake. You know, so you can conf- you feel what you're sitting on. You feel the pressure of your body on the seat in the same way that when you're out, you feel your feet in the landscape. You feel the weight of your body through your feet. You can almost feel the earth turning. You know, you're aware of the grass growing around you. You know that the landscape isn't still. You know that it's changing. Even as you look at it, it is changing in the minutest way. And it's it's being aware of all of that rather than I'm going to shoot this on a, a whatever, on a whatever lens, at F8. If that's the least important part of photography. Paul Sanders. Wonderful to hear Paul talk about uh, mindfulness. It's uh, still my desire to have one of Paul's pictures hang loud and proud. Loud? Loud, that's not right. Hang proudly. Thank you. Loud and proud? What are you talking about? Proudly. In, uh, in one of our rooms. Ah, look. The chorus in the evening. So I'm making this walk, actually, um, just hours before I'm due to publish it. And so we're getting the, the evening... Well, it's not so much a bird chorus. We got a few. The rest of them said, oh, we'll, we'll go to the pub. It's a cold evening. Um, right, 365, another amazing week. Going well. Thank you very much for joining in with the community 365. Uh, thank you for these incredible pictures that you're sending in. Um, and the 365, the community 365, is, it gives you a chance to join in with a 365 uh, feature, even if you're thinking, oh, I'd love to do it, but my own, but I, I can't be posting every single day. This is a chance to join in with our community and post amongst them. Um, studio at photographydaily.show is the email address to send your pictures into. I did say I'd pepper that address through the show, didn't I? Um, I'm, I'm going to mention just a couple uh, from, from this week's just gone, as I, as I do now. Um, but it does, <laughs> doesn't mean I like the others any less. I love them all. It's just we'd be here, if we did all seven, uh, we'd be here for ages. So let me pick, I'll pick a couple out. And one, one of these weeks, it's going to be yours. Of course it's going to be. Uh, picture 214 from Christine Bird. Very, 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 and one very for luck. Simple idea. And if making pictures... Is, um, is really about collecting. You've done precisely that. It's a picture of Christine's favourite tree. Simple as. Black and white, backdrop of a bay with a calm sea. Job done. Perfect. Thank you, Christine. 
And then Ian Stronghill, another strong, pardon the obvious, uh, a strong image, 218, striking image, Ian, of water coming down from the hills. A real take your eye into the composition picture. Oh, it truly is. And he, he wrote a few words to go along with it. A quote from the incredibly talented black and white photographer Jason Peterson. Hopefully my image has a timeless quality to it. Not only timeless as in the date, the year or century, but even also the time of day. Ian says, uh, this, was, uh, this was actually sunset and the mountain in the background, Trifan, was glowing orange as it soaked up the last rays of the winter sun. But I chose to make a black and white because in the colour image, I felt that the eye was drawn to the colour in the background. Whereas here we can explore the, the tones and the texture and the composition of the water and the rocks in the foreground, which was the real subject of the image without distraction. Bravo, I say. Um, see the collection of Community 365 pictures on the website. Uh, one a day, and if you'd like to take part, 2,000 pixels on the long side. Send them to studio at photographydaily.show. Remember, even if you have written before, uh, to include a link to your Instagram or website or something like that because it makes it much, much easier to write the show notes up, <laughs> which are usually done. They will be tonight at about 10 p.m. in the evening. Um, write a letter from Morris Webster. You sent in a mail a little while back about a blog post that you'd, you'd written that I'm going to link to today, uh, which was all about why you love photography. And, you know, I, I have this feeling that uh, it inspired the five things I love about photography feature, which uh, we've been having in the, uh, in the Patreon More show of a Saturday. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Anyway, it's a fantastic photo essay about your feelings about photography. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read a few words because I dare say these words may resonate with, uh, with some people. And then I want to talk about a particular picture in your essay, which is on the show page today. Morris writes, As a child, I was uh, always happier being on the outside looking in rather than wanting to be in the limelight seeking attention. And this is stay with me into adulthood and whilst it could lead to the assumption that i'm a, a misanthrope see there's that word um the truth is i'm interested in people but i i get as much if not more enjoyment observing others as i do interacting with them it's this enjoyment of observing others which naturally led to a, a passion i have for images and film there are there are certain historical photographs which I think have transcended the art and made a strong and lasting impression on me over the years. There are too many to list, but uh, before that instantly come to mind are Steve McCurry's Afghan Girl, Nick Oot's Napalm Girl, John Rooney's Ali standing over Liston, or Neil Leifer's version, if you prefer colour. I don't think I'm so familiar with that one. Oh, Neil, surely you are. Hmm. And Don McCullin's Near Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, your essay, Morris, um, is, is fabulous, and I, and I will link to it because I read the whole thing. Well, I want people to read it, actually. I guarantee it's worth a coffee and at least three Garibaldis and a very quiet read. As Morris says towards the end, it's, um, it's a wonderful art, photography. It's a wonderful art, hobby and profession that's allowed humanity to capture great scenes, moments and emotions and ensure there's a visual record of tomorrow's history. Being a small part of this is something I cherish. What wonderful words. Yes, because we're all a part of it. Small, medium, large, whatever we are, aren't we? We're a part of this greater collective recording moments of history. And, and on that note, the picture I want to, to talk about is, uh, which is on the blog, and I've put this particular one on, on the show page, is um, it's a haunting image that you took. As, uh, as all images that so innocently show these buildings seem now to be of the, of the Twin Towers in New York. You made it in 2000, um, a, a year before, of course, the devastating scenes that we're all sadly so familiar with. It's a, it's a black and white image made on a Pentax film camera, uh, film, of course, at the time. Um, it's, a lead, it's a leading lines uh, picture that, that take your eyes along a, a long street toward the towers that um, appear to have 
I'm not sure. Is it, is it early morning mist or, or if I were less... I don't know. If I were less kindly, perhaps air, air quality in the high sun. I don't know. But they, they do have this sort of this more ghostly feel to them, don't they? Uh, but so well framed. It's, it's for me, shocking and, and beautiful uh, all in one frame. So um, thank you for, uh, for introducing me to your blog piece. And I will share that on the show page today. And of course, that picture, as I said, as well. Um, so let's have some inspiration, shall we, from, um, from a time when New York came together following the, the next part of that story, the Twin Towers. This is Joel Meyerowitz from a few weeks ago now, episode 283, um, Awakening Our Potential, talking about Ground Zero, which he made the most incredible, powerful pictures of the... Well, of the days and months after this terrible event had happened, of um, New Yorkers um, digging and clearing and, and unpicking this, this horrific thing that had happened. Uh, but the clip I'm going to play you, the clip I'm going to play you is, is how he got to make these pictures that became uh, the book eventually. Because even though he is who he is, of course, um, and well-respected worldwide, he had to... Even Joel had to figure out a way to get into an area that had essentially been made off limits to all photographers. I had to figure out how I could get in there. A cop told me, no, no photographs, buddy, this is a crime scene. And yeah. when I heard that and I, I argued with her uh, and I said, what about the press? And she pointed and said, the press, there's the press. They're not going in either. I thought, oh, if the press is not going in, there's not going to be a record. And so I decided that's my job. I'm going to do that. I'm going to figure out how to get in there. Yeah. And so I worked, I worked, you know, the streets. I, I started to think who I knew, what, what could I do, blah, blah, blah. And finally I remembered, oh, Adrian Benepe. He was the commissioner of, of Manhattan's parks and his father was a good friend of mine. And his father had founded the green market system of New York. All the outdoor markets of New York were conceived of by his dad, who really made a great and effective um, offering to the people of New York. You know, just like I go to the green markets in London when I'm there. And so I called Adrian, who I knew since he was a little kid. He said, you're a straight arrow. I know you. I'll get you a Parks Department badge tomorrow. You go in, but we have nothing to do with you <laughs> after you go in. You're on your own. So sure enough, he gave me the little badge and I immediately scanned it and printed it out in all the colors because they were New York City and all of its stupidity. It printed the badges on construction paper that kids use in school, you know, pink, blue, red, green, yellow, yeah. magenta. Yeah. They printed it on the cheapest paper you could find available anywhere. I bought one. I bought a pack of paper and I made my own badges. I went down there. This smoky, you know, a ranger yeah. drove me in in a little three-wheeled vehicle. He dumped me in the middle of Ground Zero and said, good luck. Joel Meyerowitz. And uh, I'll link to, um, of course, on the show page to uh, his episode of a, a couple of weeks ago. This sunshine is rapidly disappearing. I'm really not sure... If I'm going to get my uh, my my sketchbook images today. Oh, I'm not sure they're not sure they're going to be my proudest. But come on, that's what sketchbooks about, isn't it? It just shows that you were here at that time. Look, the sunshine's coming out just in time, so I'm going to try and capture best I can that sunshine just disappearing behind the horizon of trees. 100th shutter speed, f5, 320 ISO. I might have to just, oh, just lower the exposure compensation slightly. Oh, we shall see. We shall see, as my dad and mum used to say. Right, Alex Soth, um, it's time for the second part. And in this second part, I want to uh, tour around Alex's relationship with photography some more. Books and making books. Uh, what having, as he calls, a, a dorky-looking box with you can achieve. And by that, I'm referring to the large 
format setup that means people accept you into their houses and let you just poke around, it seems, um, which is some, something he takes great pleasure in doing with many of uh, his assignments. Also, some, some questions, first time we've done this, actually, from our patrons uh, further on in the, the conversation. So here we are back for part two of Alex Soth. I remember you saying that you, you felt that the f- photographer's first book is often their best book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we're, yeah. we're a few more in into to your books now. Yeah, well, and I had, I mean, Martin Parr and I had a <laughs> conversation many years ago about that. And he was, he was really advocating for that. And it's, yeah, it's a frustrating notion. And it's kind of like first albums and, pre, you know, yeah, there's something magical about well, that's the, that. That's the, that's the nostalgic bit, isn't it? That's the romanticist in you. It's, it's, romantic because there's no doubt about it like for me sleeping by the mississippi is the most flawed work of mine like i just i see so many problems with it so i'm like why do our people respond talking about this one (laughs) but i do think that those flaws and that naivete is part of the energy of it you know and and it's partly what people respond to i think but you can't manufacture naivete you know, going forward. But you can try to tap into that spirit a little bit. Well, I think that's what we look for, isn't it? We try to, to tap into that naivety for the rest of our working careers. When, yeah. when, when we were when we were emboldened because we were 21 and the world was our oyster, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it, But a lot of that is, is about, for me, is about not being jaded. Yeah. And I just, uh, it's just so easy to get hip and be sort of crass about the medium. And I can do that. But when I actually go out in the world to try to like strip all that away yeah. and and enjoy it, you know. An art form for loners. It's uh, one way I've, <laughs> I've read and heard you describe your understanding of photography. It hasn't remained that way, though, has it? It hasn't. I was, it's funny because you said that and I was like, oh, gosh not really true for me um and i mean it's it's what drew me to it and it's just amazing how much i interact with other people because of it not just in the photographic act but here i am talking to you working with assistants working with publishers galleries all these people um that said i you know i recently did a little experiment with uh moving image and um, so I had to have a DP and a camera assistant and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, photography is attractive for <laughs> how few people <laughs> are required to make an image. How did so. you feel about the moving image? It's exciting. Um, but it, this particular equipment and it, it did require just a lot and then a lot rental and all this stuff, which meant more organization, which yeah. meant you could be less fluid. And it's that fluidity that, it, that we're talking about that I try to achieve. And so how can one achieve that in a moving image? Of course, there are ways, but it's, yeah, I'm definitely a photographer. <laughs> I mean, I've, yeah. I've, I've watched you work. It's a beautifully slow meditative um, process. That, that It's clearly the way that you, that you work best. And maybe that's your art background. Yeah, I mean, it's both that. And I'm nervous while I do it. <laughs> so is it's, that right? it's right. yeah, there's a lot of nervous energy, yeah. which is, I, I think that's why it's, I found it's important to go into the world and interact with people because bringing that nervous energy to that slow process, somehow those two things rub up against each other yeah. and something happens. My art background is for sure plays a big role in, in what I do in that. You know, because I'm in Magnum and I have access to uh, photojournalists yeah. and, and I just, they're just, they just come at the medium from a different place. I, I work in those spheres, but I bring this, this other background to it. I adored the way you compared having a job delivering Chinese food to your fascination <laughs> these days of, of peering into people's lives. I thought I did, I do, lo- I do love just poking my head in people's <laughs> houses. That, I mean, that is the best. What was it that I watched where you, where you were with some chap and actually really what you wanted to do was be in his house? It was the guy that was the fishing guy. That was right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I mean, you, you, right. you were enjoying photographing him in his, in his yard. I think you moved into the garage, didn't you? Yes, but, we but, did, yeah. but, but, in, but where you really wanted to be was in his house. <laughs> no, that's it's almost always the ambition. And... <laughs> And to just poke around in there. And, <laughs> and there's usually one room with the door closed, you know, and that's where I want to get into. Yeah. But that, I think yeah. that, that, that's the thing about being a photographer. It's a great enabler, isn't it? That, are, that enables you to ask questions that you otherwise wouldn't usually. It's such a, it's such a great excuse. And, a, you know, a big part of, 
of using a large format camera is just that it's so dorky looking and confused. It throws people off. It, it doesn't feel like um, a private investigator or something. Yeah. It's like, well, this guy has this large box and he's asking if he can come in my house. And it's like, it's so bizarre that they believe it. <laughs> like who would make this up? You're prolific with your projects. But it doesn't always have to be a, a complex route. I, I like that you spent some time putting pins into, I think that's how you met that that fisherman, into a map. Mm. And, yeah. and letting the people in the project come to you. I think sometimes we try and force things too much, don't we? We do, and I do. I mean, every time I, I start on something, I force it. And yeah. I, I tell myself not to do it. I give interviews in which I talk about not doing it. <laughs> and <laughs> and then I, I find myself being tight and letting my head determine the picture and till i die i'll be relearning this lesson um well we had some questions from from patrons of the the show uh peter gill asked um why did you join the nft route ah interesting when the nft thing started my response was i'm officially old (laughs) and (laughs) and this is not for me. I'm going to leave this for the kids right. to figure out. Yeah. Um, but I said, I'm not going to say all sorts of negative things about it because I did the same thing about Instagram. I was very anti Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, and we'll see what happens. And then some time passed and um, different people approached me. I turned it down. And, and then someone really talked me through the whole thing. And I was like, well, it's, in, you know, I'm curious about this. And and years ago, incidentally, I did a crazy little experiment where I sold Snapchats. All right. And all right. Ah. yeah. And it was So you were a proper early adopter in, in that Well, respect. in a funny way. Yeah. I mean, so the local art museum, they wanted to do an ex- a project where of, of ephemeral art for sale. And I was curious about Snapchat at that time. Yeah. And so I thought, you know. I'm just going to play around and see what this world is about. I'm going to dip my toes in. I am certainly no authority on the subject. I'm still learning about it, but it doesn't pay with this medium that's constantly like spinning out in different directions. It doesn't, it doesn't work to be a naysayer. Yeah. So we'll see. The jury's still out. So we expect a TikTok channel of yours soon as well then, do we? It's funny. Yeah, it's, it's really funny because I have I've, I, I have avoided that one. I mean, I, I was never on Facebook. I was no. anti-Facebook and I never no. did it. Yeah, TikTok. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, Mike Miller, and I know it's a question you've been asked many times. What does it mean being a Magna photographer? What does it mean to you personally? It's a fascinating question because it's uh, the answer evolves over time. In in the very, very beginning, uh, it was because I did come from an art background. I didn't trust the art world. And I felt like I needed sort of a backup plan, basically, of like editorial photography. And then I got into Magnum and I realized, oh, it's less about that than it's a community of other photographers that I have access to. And then I realized that it globalized my work. It like spread mm-hmm. it out in all these other ways, which was of huge value. As I get older, I mean, I'm not to the point yet, but I start thinking about, you know, what's going to happen with the work later <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and how it circulates in the, in the world. I mean, Magnum is a very complicated organization, which people outside of it really have all sorts of ideas about that usually aren't accurate. And it's it's complicated and, and it does a lot of things for me. And it also really complicates my life and makes my life difficult too. Mm. <laughs> so I don't want to over romanticize it. I, I don't know. I don't know how the voting system works, but I, I do remember you, you uh, alluded to Martin Parr. And I did see that film. Um, yourself, ah, yeah. you, yourself and Martin alluded to uh, the great late Philip Jones Griffiths, who may, who, who nearly made oh. it, uh, nearly made a difference to, um, to you being a member of the, uh, of the organization. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I mean, certainly, yeah. He and Martin had their <laughs> troubles in yes. the past, but, yeah. uh, yeah, no. And there's, you know, there are different factions within the organization and it's a complicated political yeah. organization. Um, but that's also what makes it super interesting too. Yeah. And that 
everyone's definitely not the same. Jason Nicholas asked, or rather requested, I'd love to hear something about the physicality of how you use a camera, both with portraiture and spaces. All your work seems so contemplative. I wonder how the actual physical work of setting up the camera informs you or informs how you interpret what's in front of it and the imagery that follows. That's a good question. Um, Yeah, because I often talk about space um in terms of what i'm i feel like i'm photographing is space (laughs) and i talk about how like making a portrait i'm photographing the space between myself and the subject but there's something that happens when i i set up the camera and then very often i walk across the space to you know talk to someone or move something or what have you and then i walk back to the camera i look under i go back i move something I haven't really articulated in this way before, but yes, there is something about like moving in that space. It's a performance perhaps, is it? Yeah, but it's like a piece of sculpture where you're like (laughs) carving it in a way. And I, you know, I'm I'm sort of well known amongst assistants for sweating. And so I'll like, I'm I'm like dripping with sweat, walking around, pacing around in this space. And yeah, there's, there's a real physical encounter with the space. And incidentally, the question about NFTs, one of the things I was, I was entertained by the idea that I just published this project that's all about the physicality of photography and then to do something that's absolutely (laughs) about the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, you know, it's a curious phenomenon, but yes, I'm primarily interested in the physical for sure. You know, just finally, I'm starting to understand that there is a simplicity to what we do as photographers that, um, Mm -hmm. I, I, we're collectors, aren't we? Really? You're a, you're a collector. I'm a, I'm a collector those listening uh, collectors uh, and that camera just gives us the best box to keep all this stuff in figuratively doesn't it it does uh but you you know we're all gonna die (laughs) and all this stuff is gonna be dispersed you know um so it's also absurd when you think about it yeah it's just absurd to collect all these little moments why do we do it do you think i mean i think there are multiple reasons i i mean certainly i do think that death is just built into photography and it's a way to like hold it off or to you know it's somewhat about that i think it's also um an excuse to like to spend time with something you know um and that's primarily how i think of it it's an excuse to go wander around yeah it's like you know it's like fishing it's like how much do you really care about the fish you know, mostly you just want to go out in the boat. But you wouldn't go out in the boat like that if you didn't have the excuse of fishing. It, it could be a cyclic thing here, couldn't it? Do you think that maybe, I mean, it probably won't be the, the lady that sold you the photographs, maybe, but it might be her daughter, or, I don't know. <laughs> um, do, you, do you think, uh, can you imagine Alex Soth's pictures being sold by the pound and somebody coming along in a few years' time and saying, oh, I have 60 pounds of that, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the good news about <laughs> using large format is that I produce a lot fewer photographs. But uh, <laughs> they, they weigh a lot, though. <laughs> well, true story. I rec- I'm not much of a collector of like famous photographers' photographs or what have you, but I, I recently bought a little snapshot, you know, with the borders, with the printed date um, by William Eggleston. <gasps> And the picture, if I included it in one of the, in the 60 pounds of pictures, you'd never be able to tell the difference. It looks exactly like those pictures. But of course I have it framed and hanging on my wall and it's full of all this value because it's William Eggleston. And that's interesting, which also speaks to this NFT issue. You know, what is a value uh, and why? And how do, we, how do we fill something up with value? And so my pictures, yes, they could be utterly drained of that value in a second. (laughs) Uh, Who knows? Time will tell. And it doesn't really matter anyway. (laughs) Alex Soth. Um, And I, well, I I love the the contemplation around what our pictures will, will one day bring. For some galleries, for for some national collections, I don't know, private collections, NFTs maybe, or weighed by the pound uh, for today's or indeed tomorrow's Alex Soth to find and bring to life once again as, uh, as a project or as a, as a collection, as a record of our, our lives and what we, uh, what we see and what we saw 
So, uh, yes, an absolute delight to talk with Alec. Uh, for links to our guests and other photographers that we've mentioned, plus pictures from your photo walks, follow the link in the podcast player app today, which will take you to the show page. If you're a patron, the more show tomorrow. Lots to come, as you heard earlier. Right, today's postscript to the show, today's PS. Do you know, I'm putting uh, Lynn, Lynn Fraser, I'm putting you in charge of this feature, I think as you're finding the most incredible quotes for me. And I love this. I like this a lot. You can't depend on your eyes if your imagination is out of focus. Oh, fantastic. Right, play out song. I'm a little bit worried. I may have gone a bit left field with this one, but uh, on my uh, my late night alternative music show that I fantasise about, you know the one, broadcast from the lighthouse, like the one in the movie The Fog, but without the axe and sabre killing sea zombies, dreamt up by John Carpenter. Um, This is definitely one of the songs I would play because it has that, uh, well, I think it has that, uh, I'm going to call it a a glaze eye thing, glazed eye thing, glazy eye thing, glazed eye, glazed, yeah, glaze, gooey eye thing. Let's go for that. It's a a tad hypnotic, has some, uh, well, has some intriguing sound design. Um... A whimsical voice in there as well. It's a it's a little too short for my liking, but uh, I'm hoping you have some escape escapism in there with this one. It's a song that we play at the end of the show just to just to sort of uh, wrap up with a, a few last photos that we make as we finish the walk together. Something just to to continue our, our meander for a, a few moments longer with our cameras. Um, and it's, uh, it's The Beach House by Space Doves. And I thought, hang on, we, we played Space Doves recently, but, uh, but I don't think it was this one. Uh, I was thinking that as I was looking down my notes a moment ago, thinking, did we play Space Doves? But my memory is kicking in, and I'm, I'm sure we played one called Moon. Um, it, was, it would have been John Carmichael's episode. That would make sense. I've got a pretty good memory for these songs now, so I think we're safe with this one. Oh, this is uh, this is the beach house from Space Doves. it for this week. My thanks to Alex Soth, Joel Meyerowitz, Paul Sanders, Sean Tucker, Valerie Jardin, Mikhail Palinchak, Ryan Katsanis, and those who are patrons, which you can join through the link on the website, photographydaily.show. And for those wonderful supporters who are, uh, tomorrow the More Diary Show. It's your own weekend oasis of a little extra, as I say, for your kind support. 
And we're going to be talking about my time at the asylum making pictures. It's not quite what it seems. The question of Patreon and Russian creatives. We talk uh, sound with a Canon ambassador, albeit briefly ahead of next week's show. And there's dates for the next photography retreat. Monday, Valerie Jardin sets an assignment for a new week. And if you like the music you've heard today and the production sound, well, it comes from the incredible artlist.io. Links and further research to what you've heard will be on the show page today, of course, and you'll find a, a handy link in your podcast player app for that. My thanks to Emily Renier and Neil Ford for production support, and I look forward to photographing with you hearing from you and talking with you next time. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.